Has anybody been uh, shot outside of Union Station yet this morning? I know it's only 6.05. Yesterday it was about 7 o'clock or so that that took place, so we still got an hour and change to work with. I'm just wondering, because we just put a bow on a record-setting year in Kansas City, Missouri for homicides with 182. That broke the record in 2020 of 179. And then, you know, yesterday morning, right after 7 a.m., we got people getting shot, allegedly, at bus stops. Over what? Who knows? We don't really know yet. We don't have a lot of information. By the way, welcome in. Happy Wednesday morning. I don't want to start off the show like this, but goodness gracious, violence once again is at the top of mind and at the top of the headlines for Kansas Cityans this morning. So literally a day after we put a bow on the most violent year in Kansas City history, we have a shooting right outside the IRS building, essentially across from Union Station at 7 a.m. yesterday morning. And it's believed to be tied to an argument at a bus stop close by that led to the violence. The victim suffered a single gunshot wound. Injuries are thought to be non-life-threatening per KCPD. And at this point, there is not any suspect in custody, but the investigation is still ongoing. What have I said for a long time when it comes to crime in this town and anywhere? It's not new to Kansas City. It's a reality. As crime worsens, it will spread. It will spread to parts of town that traditionally it would not be in. And... Traditionally, you would not be having people getting shot outside of Union Station during the uh, 7 a.m. still starting to get light out. You can call it daytime. Certainly, there's people commuting, right, in and out of the city, in and around that area. That's for certain. And, um, yeah, honey, great day at work today. Got to and from the office in one piece. Got to make sure I bring my bulletproof vest uh, tomorrow morning, though. Since I was pulling up to the office at about 7 a.m. and gunshots rang out and uh, a man was shot over allegedly an argument near a bus stop. It is completely out of control, but it also is very much predictable. And it's a lot of the things, unfortunately, coming to fruition that we've warned about for a couple of years and essentially pointing out, hey, if this violence issue is not gotten under control, it will start to go to places in town where it traditionally isn't. And that's what we're living through right now. So we flip the page to 2024. And, you know, there's a lot of people that deserve blame. Top of that list is Gene Peters Baker, the Jackson County prosecutor, who has been soft on crime for way too long, who has had this woke DEI mindset on crime of the real victims are the criminals themselves because society let them down a bunch of nonsense so she's at the top of the list for people to blame of course aside from the criminals themselves obviously but then you get to city leadership right and then you get to a board of police commissioners you get to a leadership in the police department the media deserves some blame for buying into all this nonsense about how local control is the problem or lack thereof in kansas city missouri But yesterday, Nick Haynes, the host of Week in Review on Kansas City PBS, he was on the show, and I asked him about Mayor Lucas. Now, the mayor is in his fifth, I guess he just wrapped up, let's see, got elected in 19, so 20, 21, 22. He just wrapped up his fourth full year in office, got reelected last year, of course. And he has now overseen the deadliest stretch in Kansas City, Missouri history. And while it's not all the mayor's fault, of course not. My biggest issue has been the fact that he has not called out the prosecutor in Jackson County for doing a terrible job. And he has not expedited the jail process in this town. We still don't have a jail. Those are the two things you can criticize him for. There's not really policy. I mean, yes, you can go back to 2020 and talk about you know, kneeling, BLM, all that stuff. But in terms of like what you can actually criticize the mayor for, those are the two things. Because if he used his bully pulpit and really started to go after the prosecutor, I think things would start changing. 
very rapidly. But Nick Haynes of Kansas City PBS yesterday, he said on this show that he believes it's not just the fact that the mayor's not saying much of anything, it's that he literally does not want to talk about it. Well, I think he's hiding from it. If you've seen his social media account, he has posted on everything over the last week uh, from every single sports game that one local team was involved in, including the Chiefs. He's talked about problems at the airport and how we can give you handy-dandy tips to look at that issue and to navigate the airport better. But not one mention, not one mention of what has been an unprecedented homicide problem on his watch. And remember, all of this is happening when we are also seeing national news reports that, boy, we just recorded the largest single-year decline in murders on record across the country. Nick Haynes is absolutely right to point that out, and we brought that up uh, at the end of yesterday's show. You have seen major American cities see double-digit decreases in homicides. New York City down 11 percent, L.A. down 16 percent, Chicago down 13 percent. Houston down 11%, Phoenix down 15 Philadelphia down 21 Kansas City up 8%, just set a record. It's wildly problematic, and here we are halfway through the first week of the new year, and no one's really said much of anything at this point in time. Now, today there is going to be a press conference. I don't know if it's a press conference or just a Q&A. But the police chief in Kansas City, Missouri, Stacy Graves, is going to be doing a press conference uh, today at 1 o'clock in the community room at KCBD headquarters. So we'll see what comes out of that. Um, if anything, if it's just a bunch of nice, fancy words, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I hope there's some plans. There's some answers here. There's something that's going to change for everybody's sake. But I don't know. Would I bet the mortgage on it? No, I would not bet the mortgage on it. That there's going to be some earth-shattering rollout of some plan that's going to dramatically change the course of history in Kansas City, Missouri when it comes to violent crime. I'm not expecting that, but I'm happy to be pleasantly surprised. I would love for that to be the case, but something tells me it's not going to happen. Uh, That being said, coming up at 7.30 this morning, Carl Oakman is the police chief in KCK. And Kansas City, Kansas just had its third straight year of declining homicides and lowest numbers in a decade. So the police chief in Kansas City, Kansas, Carl Oakman, is going to be here in the studio this morning at 7.30 um, to talk about what they're doing in Kansas City, Kansas. Why you literally flip to the other side of the state line and... They're trending down in homicides. They've had a 10-year low in homicides. Kansas City, Missouri just set a record. Why might that be? Carl Oakman's going to be here to talk about that much more at 730. That is going to be a great conversation. 913-408-7957. I mean, I can speak anecdotally as well to this on New Year's Eve. I mentioned we went out to eat Chinese food. Right. And I'm still doing cartwheels over the fact that I can now get my family out to eat Chinese food. Ten years in the making. We were considering going somewhere as a family down off the plaza. And it wasn't my call. It was the wife's call. She goes, I don't want to bring them down there at night. I don't want to do it. And that's something that when we got to town six years ago, would have never thought twice about. Would have never said. And she's like, I don't feel like bringing the girls at five and two down there at night. I don't want to do it. That's anecdotally my world. What about yours at 913-408-7957? As we get it rolling on a Wednesday morning on KCMO, it's great to be back. Kick it off 2024, day number two. And I got to tell you, um... I might not be long for this because there's a job that I really want that I might be applying for that I'll tell you about next on 95.7 FM KCMO. No, I'm not applying to be White House press secretary. Come on now. No, I'm not. Come on, man. You think I'm going to work for that goober for grandpa? I mean, plus, hopefully the guy's going to be out of a job in 12 months. So I'm I'm not going to take that position. I teased it before the break that I might not be long for this job. I mean, we're approaching year seven of the show. 
but it might be time for me to find something new to do. And I see an opportunity to, you know, put myself to use in a different way. I love doing this. Great job. Incredible listeners. Funny callers. I mean, this is the best job I've ever had by a mile. That being said, I do wonder if it's time for me to move on and at least apply for the position that is now open as president of Harvard. (laughs) I see what you did there. What do you think, John? Show some R-E-S-P-I-C-T. Before you start laughing at me, am I a fit or no? In today's climate, I kind of doubt it, but, you know, (laughs) I know that if I live long enough, things do come 360, so you may be in vogue here. We may be in vogue in about 25 or 30 years. Yeah, that's us straight white guys might be back and, you know, get a little love once again come uh, 2045, maybe. It might take another 20 plus years. It's just that your resume is so problematic yeah well (laughs) it could be problematic too that i didn't get into like boston college never mind sniffing harvard that was never gonna happen (laughs) but um claudine gay in case you you missed it university in the eastern time zone well you're that close true Mm -hmm. although i think they would thumb their nose at a place like villanova (laughs) uh it was called vanilla nova for a reason Uh, you know see uh what i I said i mean that's mm -hmm. that's what they called it back in the day i got you so uh claudine gay is out at uh, Harvard. Now, it's fascinating because this lady was getting a ton of heat. She's the one who was on Capitol Hill a few weeks ago and literally could not condemn anti-Semitism on her campus. It was one of the most stunning admissions on Capitol Hill I've seen in my life. You had the MIT president, the UPenn president, and Claudine Gay from Harvard on Capitol Hill. And they literally could not just say yes anti-Semitism is wrong, and we will not allow it on our campus. It was stunning. So the UPenn lady gets the boot, or she resigns. And then Claudine Gay also gets embroiled in this scandal around plagiarism. It turns out, you know, she's been plagiarizing things for years there at Harvard. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. And then yesterday, gosh, it would have been an hour or so after we got off the air, Turns out that she's hanging him up. She is resigning as president of Harvard. She could have buried this over the holidays. Talk about even screwing up your own resignation. She screwed that up because the time to do this was over the holidays when most people aren't really paying attention to the news. They're in Christmas mode. They're in New Year's mode. And she decides, nope, I'm going to wait until the week we get back, week the world gets back to announce my resignation. Which tells me that she wanted the attention. She wants to play the victim card. She wants her friends in the media to say, oh, poor Claudine, she got railroaded. Heck, she's probably going to have a show on MSNBC by the weekend, if I was guessing. I said there's a pretty good chance of that happening. But her resignation letter is truly an embarrassment. Rather than take responsibility for minimizing anti-Semitism, committing serial plagiarism, intimidating the free press, damaging her institution, what does she do and said? Well, she calls her critics, let's say it together, the R word, racist. racist. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you very much. Here's part of the letter from Claudine Gay as she announced yesterday she was uh, resigning as president of Harvard. She writes here, it is a singular honor and try not to shed a tear as you're getting your morning started and heading out to the office. It is a singular honor to be a member of this university, which has been my home and my inspiration for most of my professional career. My deep sense of connection to Harvard and its people has made it all the more painful to witness the tensions and divisions that have risen in our community in recent months, weakening the bonds of trust that should be our sources of strength and support in times of crisis. Sorry, I'm getting a little teary-eyed in here. 
Amidst all of this, it has been distressing to have doubt cast on my commitments to confronting hate and to upholding scholarly rigor. Two bedrock values that are fundamental to who I am. (laughs) Fake news. Bedrock. (laughs) And frightening to be subjected to personal attacks and threats fueled by racial animus. There it is. End of the second paragraph. In a six-paragraph resignation letter from Claudine Gay, she drops the whole, you're all a bunch of racists, see you later. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. That's what you get. This is the poison of DEI ideology, diversity, equity, inclusion. It is poisonous. Because anytime you can... Blame somebody else for your screw-ups. And this was just, you know, a massive screw-up. It's not hard to condemn anti-Semitism on your campus, right? It's really not difficult at all to do. And when you are caught plagiarizing on multiple occasions, it's not an honest, innocent mistake. It suddenly becomes a trend. And that's what it was. For the leader of what is supposedly the most prominent university in the country, if not the world. There was no option here but to let Claudine Gay go. She had to go. And it's very interesting, too, to see the way the media has uh, reported this over the last 24 hours. Here it is. This is from Politico. How the right toppled Harvard's presidents. Are you kidding me? No. Come on, man. Harvard President Claudine Gay's resignation is a win for right-wing chaos agents. She couldn't condemn anti-Semitism, and she's a serial plagiarist. When do we become responsible for our own actions in the eyes of media and higher education? Well, the answer is, if you check off the right boxes, never. Never. Coming up next on KCMO, happy Wednesday morning. It is great to be here with you. Carl Oakman's going to be in studio at 735, KCK Police Chief. Uh, We've got some numbers on how Congress did against the S&P 500. How are their portfolios? We'll get to that next on 95.7 FM. I'll tell you what, it is good to be in Congress. You just get all the inside information, apparently, or at least that's what the perception is out here on Main Street. Because a a new report shows that congressional Democrats beat the S&P 500 by seven points. In 2023. Now, of course, there's long been conversation around whether or not uh, members of Congress should be allowed to trade stocks. I've always believed that they should be able to trade in some capacity. Because if not, you're just going to get really rich people who are sitting on a mountain of cash in Congress, right? You're going to get old rich people who can afford to not invest in the markets. But how and where do you draw that line? Do you allow them to invest in mutual funds and ETFs, but say you can't trade single stocks? What do you do? And that's been a debate that's really picked up steam here in the last couple of years in Congress because it actually is something that has been bipartisan. And I'm happy about that. We need more things to be bipartisan in this country. And if you want to ban single stock trading, okay. But let's be honest. If you're insider trading in Congress and... You can't trade a single stock. You can still buy, let's say, an ETF that is heavily weighted in favor of the stock that you like. Like, there's no perfect way to do this. But I don't think a ban on Congress members investing is the right answer. Because if you do that, you just get old, rich people who can sit on cash. That being said, there are some red flags here in this report with the uh, 2023 year coming to an end. This report here shows that Democrats came out significantly on top due to their heavy tech portfolios. While Republicans only returned around 18 percent, which is still great. Republicans across the board underperformed as an aggregate because their portfolios are mainly in financials, oil, and commodities, which had a difficult year due to the banking collapses and high rate hikes. 
So uh, they compared Democrat portfolios to SPY, which is an ETF that basically mirrors the S&P 500. And then they had Republican portfolios on average. SPY returned 25% in 2023. It was a big year for the markets, mostly because of a handful of major tech stocks. Democrats, on average, returned 31% in 2023. Republicans, as I just noted, returned around 18%. And frankly, I question these Republicans. What are you guys doing? I mean, it's not 1982. Blue Horseshoe loves Indicott Steel. <laughs> Wall Street reference. Thank you very much. It's always great when John can drop a Wall Street reference before 7 a.m. <laughs> but, like, who thought it was a good idea this past year to invest in banks, oil, commodities? Like, I know that what you invest in oftentimes can be based around what you know, uh, what your background is. And Republicans and, you know, red states are more likely to want to be invested in things that they know. Commodities, oil, like I, I get all that. But man, anyone who's been reading the tea leaves, and I'm not here as some financial genius by any stretch of the imagination. We have guys like Mark Falter for that, who's going to be on the show this Friday. Uh, it's like it became pretty obvious pretty early in the year that tech was going to have a big year, driven in large part by artificial intelligence. Nobody saw the AI boom lifting the markets like it did this past year. And the markets are also kind of getting a little... Uh, a little too excited, in my opinion, at the idea of Jerome Powell cutting interest rates this year. We'll see what that actually means and how that plays out. But Democrats beating the market by seven points is still awfully impressive. The report calculated the return to the members who portfolios perform the best. Among them, Nancy Pelosi. Talk about a bombshell. Now, her husband is a trader. We understand that. But still, it is awfully convenient, is it not? Susan Collins out of Maine. Dan Goldman, New York. Dan Crenshaw, Texas. And then Mitch McConnell makes the cut. How about that? The top member was Representative Brian Higgins, Democrat from New York who represents the Buffalo area. Now... (laughs) His portfolio is up 239%. So I, that doesn't make any sense. I, it's, it's like the guy had a net worth of 10000 and now he's you know, got a net worth of 23000 or something. I, I, I don't know how his portfolio is up 239%. I don't think that's insider trading. I think that's a guy that like, was on the Dave Ramsey fan, plan and just finally started investing and paying off his debts, and now he's got some money. I, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Unless he's like me and he you know, hit the stock of his life like I did with Roku back in 2018 when I got to town. And I bought a Roku device for my apartment in downtown Kansas City, and I started doing some research on Roku. And I'm like, man, this thing's the way of the future. So I bought a bunch of shares of Roku stock at like 38 bucks a pop. But stupid me, it went up to $450 a share in the middle of the pandemic and I sat on it. I'm like, we're taking this thing to the moon, baby. We're going to 1000 a share. You just watch. And now it's sitting at about $90 a share. So, I, I mean, it, you know, I've done okay with it. But uh, I should have unloaded when I had the chance at $450 a share. So, I don't know if that's what happened to Representative Brian Higgins here or what the deal is. But <laughs> he led the way with a 239% increase in his portfolio. But all in all, it remains good to be in Congress, and something does need to be done on this front. So I like going through these numbers, and I'll share the article on my Facebook and uh, Twitter page, at Pete Mundo. Look for it there. That way you can see these numbers for yourself. Um, It's always good to have this in front of you. Just, you know, keep an eye on people. And no one locally, by the way, in Kansas or Missouri found themselves in the top, like, 25 people that I'm seeing here. So... I'd say that's a good sign. Now, all that being said, it's looking like it's going to be a tumultuous 2024. The markets, the election, overseas issues, foreign policy, it's going to be, I believe, a pretty chaotic 2024. That being said, we thought 2023 was going to look like that, and 2023, all in all, wasn't as bad as people projected it to be. But this is interesting. You know, with the economy still in this place where the markets are doing well, but Main Street isn't, 
I saw this in the Wall Street Journal. It kind of ties into my Roku story from a minute ago. Americans are canceling more of their streaming services. Hulu, Netflix, and other streamers are turning to bundles, discounts, and ad-supported plans as customer defections rise. So basically, people are bailing on some of these streaming services because you can only have so many. Right? Like, that's why this was never going to be a long-term play like some of these streaming services thought it was going to be. Yes, Netflix will be okay because it's Netflix. But a lot of the streaming services, not only that, their platforms are horrendous. We have Paramount Plus. I mean, it is just garbage. It's got good content on it. I just got done watching um, uh, Lawman Bass Reeves, which was a great series done by the guy who did Yellowstone, Taylor Sheridan. But the interface for Paramount Plus is horrendous. But what a lot of these streaming services are realizing is that, listen, in tougher economic times, people are not going to have seven streaming services at five to ten bucks a pop. They're not going to do it. So I don't know about you. We haven't canceled any yet. I've thought about a couple of them that we don't use a ton, but we also don't overdo it. But the other problem that you have is that you pay a certain price for these services, and then they slowly start going up. And then suddenly you're sitting there and you're like, wait, I was paying 99 cents a month for this thing. Now it's $9.99 a month. And now you're like, you know what? At 10 bucks a month, screw it. I'll get in for a dollar a month, John, but I'm not getting mm-hmm. in right. for 10 bucks a month. Right. Yeah. We jettisoned Hulu. Did you get rid of it? This quarter. And then we're going to do the same with Netflix cost cutting thing, but it's on the phone bill. Oh. So it's already built. We're already paying for that. Oh. So that's shrewd. Maybe that's the yes. wave of the future there. See? Interesting. How about that? So that's on the... F- oh, okay. I've never mm-hmm. seen that before. So you jettisoned Hulu. Now, that's interesting because Hulu is like YouTube TV, which is what I have. Um, yeah, I have a Roku, and so I watch YouTube a lot in the network TV. You yeah. Know, sports and stuff. Anything that's on- I want to see is on network TV, local teams, basically. Okay. So you just have what... Rabbit ears for that, basically? Yeah, you got an antenna in the back. It's kind of a little nylon panel type thing you're not buying now. So you're getting rid of Hulu. Yeah, we're going to cut the cord. All right. Well, here's and, the and thing. And went to some streaming and had a package where they were together for a while, but then they went up. They went up. So my wife invest, uh, looked into it, and that was the deal. It's like, she goes, I was going to drop Netflix, but it's on the phone bill, so we'll, we'll have Netflix. We'll now. have Netflix and not Hulu. Yep. You know, like YouTube TV, which we have, started off at like 45 bucks a month. And now it's mm-hmm. 72 bucks. Ouch. Month. Yeah. I mean, it's basically becoming a cable bill, which yeah, they yeah. get me in at a $40 a month price point five years ago now. And then it keeps going up, 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 up. So it just. Is it commercial free? No, it's it's basically the, like a cable package. Right. Okay. Well, so I just you, watch YouTube on my Roku. So yeah. I don't do the TV part and I didn't know what was on their exclusive content or. I know they're no, no. digital commercial free and stuff. But. It's basically like having cable. It's got ESPN, yeah. the local oh, news, right, right, right. Gotcha. you know, Bravo, mm-hmm. HGTV. Mm-hmm. It's it's yeah. basically cable. It's just, uh, you know, done through YouTube essentially mm-hmm. is what gotcha. it is. But it's not the deal that it was even a couple of years ago. So something tells me that this, like this is a sign of where the economy is at far more than what the Dow Jones is doing this morning or the S&P 500. When the, when the streaming services are having to cut their prices or offer ad-supported streams or start bundling things, that tells you a lot more about where the American mindset is at than looking at the stock market. 913-408-7957. That's our studio line and our text line here on KCMO Talk Radio. Carl Oakman, the KCK Police Chief, is going to be in for a great conversation at 7.30 this morning. Don't miss that after a... Very impressive year for KCK on the crime front. We'll talk about the successes there with him in 45 minutes on KCMO. Meantime, uh, one area city is finally demanding its homeless camps move away. We'll tell you who and where next on KCMO 95.7 FM. We got a half hour until Carl Oakman, KCK police chief, is in our studios here at KCMO after they had a Decade-low number of homicides on that side of the state line, while KC Mo has its worst year ever for homicides. So we'll talk about the good things they're doing there in KCK now with Carl Oakman, who was with the KCMO Police Department before taking that chief job at KCK a couple of years back. 
um, in a half hour. Looking forward to that. Happy Wednesday morning. It's great to have you here. So I'm looking through the news, and I saw this headline last night, and I'm like, oh, crap. Here we go. And the headline read as follows on CNN.com. Man breaks into Colorado Supreme Court overnight and opens fire, police say. Now, you're asking the obvious question, as you should be, as I did to myself. And thankfully, and credit to CNN for putting this right in the second paragraph, not in like the 22nd paragraph. The preliminary investigation, they write, confirmed a high probability that the incident is not connected to recent threats against the Colorado Supreme Court justices. In the wake, of course, of, you know, Donald Trump getting kicked off the ballot by the state Supreme Court and all that nonsense. But you see that headline and that's the first thing you think about. But we now know that at least the there's a high probability that the incident has no connection to all the drama out there around the Colorado Supreme Court. But I can't help but think that this is not going to be the last time we see a headline like this and that 2024 is going to be defined in large part, and this pains me to say, but by both political sides basically claiming that no matter what happens this year, their side got screwed and the election results are unfair or wrong. I could see this happening no matter who wins this year because that's how this entire thing has been set up with Donald Trump's legal woes being at the top of that very list. Right? Now you have him getting kicked off of state ballots in Colorado and Maine and you have people being interviewed about this stuff and there's no shame whatsoever by any of these people. Last night, Wolf Blitzer was interviewing the main secretary of state. Her name is Sheena Bellows. So Wolf Blitzer is sitting there looking constipated, as he always does when he's on TV, as he has for, you know, decades now. I've never seen a guy. I, I don't even know if that's Wolf Blitzer's real face at this point. I'm starting to be convinced that it's like a mask he's wearing because the guy has had the same constipated look for 25 years on that network. It's actually pretty impressive that he can pull it off. But anyway, he's he's sitting there, he's looking as he always looks, and he asks an obvious question to the main secretary of state about Donald Trump being off that ballot. Do you have any concern uh, taking Trump off the ballot risks tearing, tearing the country apart? My duty under Maine election law and the Constitution and the oath I swore to the Constitution is, was to look exclusively at the hearing and the evidence before me and make a decision based on the law. Neither political considerations nor personal considerations for my safety could enter into that decision. I had a duty and an obligation to follow the Constitution, as do all of us who serve in government. That was Sheena Bellows, Maine Secretary of State on CNN, talking to Wolf Blitzer. Now, this isn't about the legal side of any of this. I mean, that's been litigated ad nauseum. There's no more that needs to be said about it. It's all political. But here's my concern going into this year, as we get this year underway. If it ends up being a rematch of 2020, and God bless us all if it is, both sides are going to claim election interference, unfair elections, if they lose. That's what's going to happen. We know what the Trump side is going to look like. I mean, and they're going to basically come out and say, and there's going to be a strong case for this, by the way, that Donald Trump was attacked politically by states, by state Supreme Courts, to basically influence the election and turn the election against him. But it's not limited, by the way, to that side, because here's what's also going on. There's a movement on the Democratic side to discredit the Supreme Court because it's expected that the Supreme Court will overturn the Colorado Supreme Court and its decision to keep Trump off the ballot. Now, we know that Donald Trump appointed three Supreme Court justices. So there will be and there's already a groundwork being laid to discredit the Supreme Court 
for when they likely overturn the decision by the Colorado Supreme Court. So then if the Supreme Court puts Trump back on these state ballots and let's say Donald Trump beats Joe Biden and becomes president, what's going to happen? There's going to be massive outcry from Democrats claiming the election's rigged. It's not an accurate election uh, because the Supreme Court put Donald Trump back on these state ballots, which should have never happened to begin with. I'm just saying we are setting things up right now for a 2024 that is going to be a mess, that the loser, no matter what, is going to claim potentially that they got railroaded and it was not a free and fair election. That's what we're staring down the barrel at. And I don't like that for a second. It's not good for the country if the loser always assumes that they got cheated or robbed. But that's what's happening. Now, listen, I, I've made it pretty clear that Trump should be on these state ballots. I mean, it's not really a strong legal case that's being made, as far as I can tell. Just sitting here in this studio and obviously living through the last four years, keeping the guy off the ballot, saying you're defending democracy by keeping the guy off the ballot, just doesn't make any sense. Whether you hate him or not shouldn't really be the point here. He deserves to be on the ballot. And you let the American people decide who they want to be their next leader of the free world. That's it. But it's just as dangerous what is happening when you see people trying to discredit the Supreme Court in the way that they are. And there's a reason that it's happening right now. Because we all know the Supreme Court ultimately is probably going to have to decide on whether or not to put Trump back on these state ballots. Here's the best thing that can happen, though. The best thing that can happen is that some of the progressive Supreme Court justices... Sonia Sotomayor, Katanji Brown-Jackson, that they actually vote to put Trump back on the ballot. That puts all this to rest. I would love for it to be 9-0. It's probably not going to happen. I'll take 8-1. I'll take 7-2. At least one or two of them have to, first off, do the right thing legally but also just do the right thing for the country. Because if not, you thought 2020 was chaotic. 2024, forget it. It's going to make that look like child's play no matter what happens. And I don't want that to be the case. But that's how this thing is being set up on both sides. Carl Oakman, bottom of the hour. Coming up next, how about this? Um, Jackson Mahomes could have a bunch of these charges dropped And it's because of something I hinted at when this story first came to be early in 2023. I told you that there was a lot going on here behind the scenes that was not getting proper reporting. And I think that's going to result in these charges being dropped. I'll explain it next on KCMO Talk Radio 95.7 FM. Well, 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 how about this? A development in the uh, Jackson Mahomes saga and drama. Here's KCTV5. To dismiss the charges against Jackson Mahomes. He was facing three felony counts of aggravated sexual battery. Mahomes is accused of forcibly kissing the owner of an Overland Park restaurant inside her office. Also facing a misdemeanor battery charge for pushing a waiter. Now that charge is not being dropped at this time. All right. So that's from KCTV5. So prosecutors in Johnson County moving to dismiss some of the charges against Jackson Mahomes. Um, prosecutors filed this motion yesterday to dismiss three felony charges of aggravated sexual battery against Mahomes. But as you heard there from KCTV5, while those three charges could be dropped, The one charge that would stay would be the misdemeanor battery charge. Why? Well, that's involving a different person. You have uh, the grabbing and the kissing of the owner of Aspen's restaurant, which, as I understand it, I think is closed, I believe. Um, And then you have the misdemeanor battery charge against a different employee, uh, one of the waiters at the restaurant. So that one's going to stay. But the big one, of course, was the video, the kiss, the grab, everything else. And I mentioned to you when all this was coming out months ago 
that I had some information that suggested that this was not what it appeared to be. Not that guys or anybody, for that matter, should be grabbing anybody and kissing them against their will. But that the full story was not out there in terms of how well these two individuals knew each other. And here's the most important part of the story. Prosecutors said the owner of Aspen's also said even if she were granted immunity, she would say that she has not been truthful to the police and that the encounter with Jackson Mahomes was consensual. I'm not here to do Jackson Mahomes' bidding. I'm really not interested in doing that. I still think he's, you know, a TikTok clown and wants to live off his brother's name. That being said, we see this happen far too often. Where a guy gets accused of something, something gets taken out of context, and we throw him to the wolves before having any of the facts. And it was my belief that that was at least in part what was happening here based on some of what I knew behind the scenes involving these two individuals. And now, according to prosecutors, the woman who alleged all this, the owner of Aspen's restaurant, the person who made all this a story to begin with, who conveniently had the videotape lined up in the perfect position for that kiss now says she has not been truthful to police and that the encounter with Jackson Mahomes was consensual. Now, I'm not an attorney here. You know, if I was, I'd be doing something very different, I would imagine. But when do we start making examples of people who just willy-nilly accuse men of these types of things and then backtrack on it when they allegedly get caught? Because this happens far too often with people much more famous than Jackson Mahomes and much more important than Jackson Mahomes. This is just, I mean, this is small potatoes compared to some of the bigger examples of this that have taken place in our culture these days. But these guys get their names dragged through the mud. They get torn down. They get destroyed. And then, of course, the apology or the retraction never gets a tenth of the attention that the accusation got. And that's exactly what's happening here. Everyone, I mean, I guarantee you, you go around, you do a man on the street poll anywhere in Kansas City, and people will know that Jackson Mahomes got accused of, you know, this thing and grabbing this woman by the neck and kissing her inappropriately and doing it against her will and all this stuff, right? Like, everyone will know that story. How many people, and I know it's early in the new year, and people are getting back into their routines and, you know, back to figuring out the news cycle and following the news cycle. But how many people in this town do you think realize what I just said is in the report from the prosecutors? That the owner claims if she were granted immunity, she would say that she has not been truthful to police and that the encounter was consensual. 5%, maybe. 10% on a good day. I guarantee it's under 5%, but I bet you 50% of the public in this town knows about the accusations against Jackson Mahomes, and probably if they were to see him on the street, be like, oh, there he is. Oh, stay away from Jackson Mahomes. Never know about that. Oh, boy, he might grab you and start molesting you and kissing you and doing all this inappropriate stuff. It's just unfair. Now, guys got to be smart, too. Guys, you got to, I mean, make sure you're not putting yourself in some of these dumb positions, and that's the biggest thing you can probably knock Jackson Mahomes for. Start having a few drinks. You let your guard down a little bit. You start acting stupid. So, guys, you got to be careful. But at the same time, I believe there has got to start being consequences for whether it's Jackson Mahomes or, you know, big shots in Hollywood who are getting accused of things that simply turn out to not be true. Because for every pig scumbag like Harvey Weinstein, you know, there's other folks who are having their lives ruined. Like the punter, and I'm forgetting which team he was with, but the guy who was, you know, coming out of college, he was this rock star punter. He got accused of a sexual assault. He got kicked off the team right after he got drafted. 
and he hasn't had a career since then. And it turned out the whole thing was one big lie. That stuff is happening far too often, and it's time for legal action to be taken against women who are doing this stuff to these guys, whether it's for money or fame or anything else. Coming up, one of the great stories in Kansas City across the region in 2023 was Carl Oakman, KCK Police Department, decade low in homicides as KC Mo hits a record. Carl Oakman in our studios next. What a dichotomy, KCK to KC Mo. You just heard from KCK Police Chief Carl Oakman, who was in studio for a half hour. Great to have him here. Um, really appreciate his time and sharing the stories in KCK and what they've done over the last uh, couple of years during his tenure. And the first time I, I heard of the guy, or he became a somewhat household name, is during 2020. During the riots of that summer, and he became a spokesperson in many ways, uh, for the police department to discuss what was going on in the plaza that summer and everything else that was happening you know, in the wake of the George Floyd stuff. So then he gets, a year later, the KCK job, and it's been nothing but uh, positives since then with all these numbers trending in the right direction. Meantime, you hop across state line and they're setting a record. So today, in KC Mo, the police chief, Stacey Graves, is going to do a press conference or a QA, and I believe it is, at about 1 o'clock um, at headquarters. We'll see what comes out of that as they talk about plans for 2024. And uh, we'll have, of course, Mayor Lucas on tomorrow morning at 730. And it's amazing how little information and I believe little media interest has come out over the last couple of days regarding a record year for homicides in Kansas City, Missouri. Maybe it's, you know, we get numb to it, but I also think... There's a part of the media in this town that would much rather, you know, reshare or promote Chiefs games and new airports and new initiatives like that. All of which are, you know, very important. You can do both. We can talk about airport initiatives and, you know, leaders being at Chiefs games and rah, rah. We can do all that. But also say, hey, 182 homicides is completely unacceptable. And bring it up and stop protecting people in power. The media's job is not to protect people in power. It's to call them out. And they can't even do that. In large part because they are beholden to certain ideology. And in large part, they're to blame. Because they carried the water for a lot of this insane crap back in 2020. That, you know, we're still dealing with today. Just dumb policy. So uh, always great to have Carl Oakman on, and we appreciate his time. Um, One of the very bright spots in the Kansas City region over the last 12 months. So this, I I stumbled upon this uh, article last night. In the New York Times of all places. And the headline was, The People Who Brought You Travis Kelsey says here, a plan was hatched to make the football player as famous as The Rock. And it began long before you might guess. Now, I start reading this, and my gut reaction is to say, I know it. I knew he's focused on things other than football. He's not 100% bought in. But then as I read along this article and I took a step back, I said, no, 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 that's not fair. Because the more you read through this piece, and I'll put it up on my social media pages, the more you realize that Travis Kelsey has wanted to be, forget football famous. I mean, there's football famous, and then there's like famous famous, right? There's Hollywood famous. There's there's pop star Taylor Swift famous. It's a different level of famous. Travis Kelsey's living it right now. I mean, the guy lived in a neighborhood in the Northland where anyone could drive past his house, and no one really bothered him. Then he got famous famous, and the whole thing changed. But it's interesting because the article starts off here by saying, in the only recent year in which Travis Kelsey and the Chiefs were not playing in the Super Bowl, the NFL star was driving around Los Angeles in early February with his business managers, Andre and Aaron Enos, marveling at billboards featuring Dwayne Johnson, the actor and entertainer better known as The Rock. Mr. Kelsey said, man, I don't think I'll ever be as famous as The Rock. His co-managers looked at each other and said, yes, you can be. 
The twin brothers had known Mr. Kelsey since he was at the University of Cincinnati and that the six foot five athletic star with the Marvel character physique, blue eyes and affable charm had crossover potential. But let's be honest, the New York Times writes, nobody imagined this. This was a year even The Rock might envy. Mr. Kelsey, a tight end, won the Super Bowl his second in February. In March, he hosted Saturday Night Live. He starred in seven national television commercials. The podcast that he co-hosts with his brother is among the most popular on Spotify. He launched a clothing line with his team. And he's dating the world's most famous pop singer. The reality is that most of his ascent has been years in the making, the result of a carefully manicured business plan developed by the 34-year-old Enos brothers that blossomed at precisely the right moment. As I was reading through this article, I was thinking to myself, for so much of this for Travis Kelsey, it's right place, right time. Being on the Chiefs with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. Why did that matter? Well, when you're a Super Bowl champion, and this story goes on to note this, he had been making pitches and his managers had been making pitches to Saturday Night Live for years. Travis Kelsey wants to be a superstar beyond football. For years, he's been reaching out to SNL. Two things happened over the last couple of years. One, he went on his own time in the offseason to like an SNL party and he met with Lorne Michaels who's the, you know, behemoth mastermind behind SNL. And he impressed Lorne Michaels. He dropped into a party in October of 2021 before a game in Philadelphia and chatted up Lorne Michaels. And then what happened? This February or last February after the Super Bowl, the morning after 9 a.m., SNL calls. And they say, we want Travis to host. Right place, right time. If Travis Kelsey is not on this team with Patrick Mahomes, with Andy Reid, winning Super Bowls, SNL is probably not calling. If he doesn't go out of his way in October of 2021 to meet with Lorne Michaels, he probably never gets that call. Think about it from your perspective, right? All of us have a story like that where we went out of our way to meet with somebody who we thought down the road might be able to help with a future career opportunity. I can think of flying to Dallas seven years ago to meet with somebody waiting outside the building and that person helping me get this job almost six years ago now. That's how life works. Travis Kelsey did that because he wanted to be more than football famous. And when you look at this plan that Kelsey rolled out, And his people around him rolled out for the better part of 10 years. It goes back to when he was doing that dopey catching Kelsey show. He had the dating show back in 2015. And apparently his handlers wanted no part of it. But Travis was like, yeah, you know, let's give it a shot. And it was one and done. The show was a total bust. It went eight episodes. He never caught love. I think he was trying to catch love or whatever it was. But it was about laying the foundation for being a potential TV star. So the easy and the cheap takeaway here, if you read this article in the New York Times about, you know, making Travis Kelsey, is not about, oh, he's not focused on football anymore. The Chiefs are struggling. Kelsey, Taylor Swift. No, that I, I wanted that to be my takeaway. But the more I read it, it was like, no, this guy has wanted to be Hollywood famous for a decade. He's great at football. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. But he has wanted this. And he has worked towards this forever. And by the way, the article also puts to bed any idea that Taylor Swift is somehow just a pawn in the game of Travis Kelsey being famous. That's not the case at all. I I know, I know, I know. Some of you want to go down that road, but that is not the case by any stretch of the imagination. 3D chess, Pete. (laughs) That's what's really... (laughs) He has convinced the world's most famous pop star, a billionaire... To, to date this poor boy, which mm-hmm. is really what he is compared to her, her sure. so he can be famous. No, 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 no. But it does go to show you the guys had a plan for a decade to be famous off the football field, and over the last few months, it has happened. And it's happened in a way that none of us could have ever predicted. Uh, bottom of the hour, Patrick Ishmael with the Show Me Institute will be here. Uh, talk about the Missouri legislative session. That's getting underway. 
Uh, meantime, the dumbest idea, uh, well, I don't want to overstate it. <laughs> it might not be the dumbest idea I've seen in a while. Yeah, wait a minute. It's early in the year. <laughs> You're right. I could say it's the dumbest idea of the year, but we're only on day three. So I don't think that's overstating it. But you see this idea that's coming to the Kansas City airport that people are pushing for? Yeah, let's go hang out at the airport. We don't have a ticket, but people really want to hang out at the airport. This makes no sense to me. I will share it with you next on KCMO Talk Radio 95.7 FM.